Good morning, everybody. This is Imelda reading for you today. And this is Madeline. And we're starting with the Society News for Friday, the 8th of June. On Tuesday, the strollers will be meeting for a walk through Pig Leg Lane in Ryde. The minibus will be leaving Millbrook House at 9.20. They will meet for coffee at Bartlett's Farm at approximately 10.40. The walk will set off from Quarry Road in Ryde and lunch will follow afterwards at the Apley Manor which is booked for midday. The Ryde Swimming Group will be swimming this coming Tuesday at the Waterside Pool in Ryde. The Swimming Group has sole use of the pool during the session and there are lifeguards in attendance. If you are interested in joining the group please contact the Society to advise us of your swimming ability and for us to advise the waterside pool. The weekly coffee morning will be held at Millbrook House this Wednesday the 13th of June. The coffee mornings are not just for blind and partially sighted people. Anybody can come along and have a cup of coffee or tea as well as a piece of cake. We will be holding the low vision drop-in between 10 a.m. and 12 noon on Wednesday. This is a weekly event to allow you to view and try the low vision equipment we have at the Society without the need for an appointment. The book group will be meeting at the Lord Louis Library on Wednesday between 2 and 3 p.m. We discuss the last month's book over tea and coffee and hand out the book for the next month. The books are available on CD or USB. Please contact Laura Jasper on 52205 for more information or email members at iwsb.org.uk. There will not be a meeting of the Thursday social group on the 14th of June due to the members' summer party, which is being held at Millbrook House between 2.30 and 4.30. If you are intending to come along to the party and haven't already RSVP'd, then please contact Laura Jasper on 52205 or members at iwsb.org.uk by a Tuesday the 12th of June so that we can confirm numbers for catering. And some other news, there will be a fundraising bucket collection in aid of Sight for White outside Morrison's supermarket in Newport between 10am and 1pm on the morning of Saturday the 9th of June. Friday the 15th of June is the closing date for the kayaking session which is being held on Friday the 6th of July. For more information or to register your interest please call Laura on 52205 or email members at iwsb.org.uk. The popular BBC Two quiz show Eggheads is looking for contestants. They are looking for teams of six with the quizzing know-how to take on the resident general knowledge geniuses. If you think you've got what it takes and would like to challenge the eggheads, then you can email eggheads at 12yard.com or write to eggheads applications 12yard productions the Hub G7, 70 Pacific Key, Glasgow, G511DZ. The closing date is midnight on the 22nd of June 2018. Local volunteers from the Guide Dogs charity will be visiting a number of venues over the next few months, talking about the work of the charity and how you can be involved. They will be at Sandown Library on the 23rd of June, Ride Library on the 21st of July and Ventnor Library on the 18th of August. All the library venue times will be 10.30am till 2.30pm. You can also find them on the Isle of Wight Community Club Open Day at Park Road in Cowes 
on August the 27th from 12 noon onwards. Do you enjoy the activities and facilities provided by Site for White? Perhaps you've recently attended an activity or, or event and would like to wax lyrical about it? If so, then Chris Kane would like to hear from you. As part of promoting well-being and supporting services and activities, we would like to hear your positive feedback, which will be part of a video promoting Site for White. If you have a story you would like to enthuse about and don't mind being recorded on video, then please contact Chris Kane on 52205 or email admin at iwsb.org.uk. And now the scaffolding news. Please find below a list of known footway obstructions for works including scaffolding or hoarding. We are unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week by week basis. Also included are tables and chair permits that have been issued in the past week. First the Bay and Ventnor area. There is currently scaffolding at Premier Inn 1 to 9 Esplanade Sandown, 11A and 11B St John's Road Sandown, 79 High Street Sandown, The Toy Master 103 High Street Sandown, 64 High Street Shanklin, 40 Little Stairs Road Shanklin, Shanklin Hotel East Mount Road Shanklin, The United Reformed Church High Street, Shanklin, the corner of Trinity Road and Madeira Road, Ventnor 1, <coughs> Ventnor, Boniface Road and into Trinity Road, Ventnor, Hose Road St Dixon, 1 High Street, Ventnor, Lewis Cottage, Market Street, Ventnor, 21 West Street, Ventnor. And there are currently skips at 64 Newport Road, God's Hill, Undercliff House 5 Esplanade Shanklin, 25 Donington Drive Shanklin, 64 Steep Hill Road Shanklin and 26 South Street Ventnor. There are currently hoardings at White City Culver Parade Sandown, Premier Inn 1-9 to Esplanade Sandown and the United Reformed Church High Street Shanklin. And in the Cows area, there is currently scaffolding at the Royal London Yacht Club, the Parade, Cows, Sainsbury's, 129 to 130, High Street, Cows, 3 Castle Road, Cows, 78 Park Road, Cows. And there are currently skips at 42 St Andrew's Street, Cows, 4 Trafalgar Court, Terminus Road, Cows, 22 St David's Road, East Cows, and 9 Alpany Road, East Cows. And there are currently hoardings at 93 High Street, Cows. In the Newport area, there is currently scaffolding at 18 Lugley Street, Newport, Domino's, St James Street, Newport, 42 Trafalgar Road, Newport, Clinton's Cards, High Street, Newport, WH Smith, 55 to 56 High Street, Newport, Therapy, 2 to 8 Carisbrook Road, Newport, White Mountain Bike Shop, St James Street, Newport, Scaffold is up on Orchard Street, 34 Clifford Street, Newport, 2 Avondale Road, Newport, Farnsworth Newsagent, 76 St James Street, Newport, Visual Impact, Holyrood Street, Newport. In the Ride area, there is currently scaffolding at Rectory Mansion, 1 Key Lane, Braiding, Clinton Cards, High Street Ride, W. H. Smith, 20 to 21 High Street Ride, 
St James Church, Market Street Ride, 26 George Street Ride, The Colonnade, Lind Street Ride, 13 Cross Street Ride, Charcoal Grill, 65A Union Street Ride, Superdrug, High Street Ride, Kids & Co, 22 High Street Ride, Bakehouse, Stein Road, Seaview, there are currently skips at 4 South Street Ride, 2 Cornwall Street Ride, 113 High Park Road Ride, Sand Cove, Pier Road, Seaview, Rock Cliff, Circular Road, Seaview, and 11 Glendale Close, Wootton. And finally, in the West White area, there is currently scaffolding at Memorial Hall, Avenue Road, Freshwater, Jojo's, School Green Road, Freshwater, Holdings and Old Post Office, Key Street, Yarmouth. And now, this week's In Touch. In Touch in this week's episode, new research into echolocation. echolocation. Peter White records being four years old when echolocation just clicked. He was walking under a railway bridge and discovered that making a sound could give him an echo impression of the height of it. Videos and podcasts about the American exponent, exponent Daniel Kish have drawn a wide audience <coughs> and he's been involved in the formal teaching of the skill, despite many blind people feeling it is instinctive. In Touch has had first view of a new Durham University research into the technique with Dr. Law Thaler, and we catch up with a 20-year-old we spent time with in an echolocation lesson 10 years ago to see if he's kept up the skill. There's more information about echolocation courses at Durham here. There's http double, double forward slash community dot dot ac dot uk forward flash echolocation forward flash workshops dot html. We also talked to the BBC Gary O'Donoghue in Washington, who's been trying out a new technological frontier in real-time description for blind people. And now we come to the Isle of Wight County Press for the 8th of June. The one headline is Trust Inadequate Despite Progress. And this is an article by Megan Baines. The Isle of Wight National Health Service Trust has been told it must make further significant improvements to the quality of its services following an inspection by the Care Quality Commission. The trust was again rated inadequate following an inspection in January. An inspection in November 2016 first led the trust to be rated inadequate and was subsequently placed into special measures. In January, inspectors visited the trust, again with a brief to look at management and leadership particularly. The trust has again been rated as inadequate overall and inadequate for safety and how well it is led. Effectiveness and, and res responsiveness were rated as requires improvements, a slight improvement, and caring was rated as good. The trust will remain in special measures. Inspectors rated 21 out of 23 core services as good for caring. Patients' transport services was rated outstanding for caring. As a result of improvements over the past year, the CQC removed a condition which required the Trust to ensure the mental health acute and rehabilitation inpatient environments were fit for purpose 
and to operate an effective system to prioritise patients who urgently needed access to community mental health services. A similar condition as community mental health services will remain in place until the Trust can demonstrate significant improvement. Inspectors said safety systems were not fit for purpose or were not implemented sufficiently across many services. In surgical services, medical staff were not sufficiently engaged in the safety checks in surgery. Staff did not always assess and manage risks to patients appropriately to keep them safe from avoidable harm. They found staff did their utmost to provide compassionate care and involve patients in decision making. However, they did not always follow best practice to keep them safe from infection. There were areas where inspectors saw how staff satisfaction and staff working in sorry, I need to repeat that. There were areas where inspectors saw low staff satisfaction and staff working in isolated teams. Staff could be perceived as defensive when under pressure, and some leaders did not always promote a positive culture that supported and valued staff leaving some doctors disengaged. While there was some improvement in reporting serious incidents, it was not embedded across all services. Staff did not always recognise or report serious incidents, and there was limited evidence of learning from those incidents. Inspectors said patients could not always access services when they needed them, in particular people in mental health crisis units. Chief Inspector of Hospitals, Professor Ted Baker said, while we have seen sufficient progress to remove restrictions on some mental health services, we still need to see further improvement in community mental health services. There are some areas where we still have significant concerns about patient safety. Although the trust was rated inadequate for how well it was led, inspectors said Chief Executive Maggie Oldham demonstrated exceptional leadership skills. They said there was hope for the future of the trust. Inspectors found examples of outstanding practice in acute patient services and emergency ambulance services. There was a strong culture of promoting quality and teamwork in the hospital sterilisation and decontamination unit. The Community First Responder programme was also recognised and paramedics from the service were recognised for delivering life-saving high-dose antibiotics to patients with suspected sepsis before they reached hospital. The Asthma and Allergy Unit was also recognised for providing outstanding services. Miss Oldham said, Although the trust remains rated as inadequate overall, the CQC identified a number of areas of progress, including several examples of outstanding practice. It was pleasing to see the CQC find clear signs of recovery and improvement since its last inspection and that there is growing momentum here. Furthermore, it acknowledged the caring and compassionate staff we have here. However, the fact remains we have not improved our overall rating from inadequate and we are under no illusions we still have a lot of hard work ahead of us to turn things around. We have always said our improvement journey would not be an easy or a short one. As the CQC rightly concluded, we are in the early stages of our improvement journey and there is now potential for significant improvement at the Trust. I'm absolutely confident we can and will deliver the services our patients expect and deserve. And more on the same theme, waiting targets still being missed. More than 20% of cancer patients on the Isle of Wight were still waiting for treatment two months after an urgent GP referral. 
a report to the governing body of the Clinical Commissioning Group, CCG, last week revealed 78% of patients were seen within two months of referral. The target set by the NHS is 85%. More than 95% of patients receive their first treatment within two months following a consultant's decision to upgrade the priority of the patient. Waiting time targets for non-urgent medical treatment were also consistently missed. There were 21 incidents of patients having to wait over a year for non-urgent medical treatment. The tar target set by the NHS is zero. There were 11 incidents of patients waiting more than 12 hours from the decision to admit to actual admission, known as trolley waits. Christine Lightbody from the Save Our National Health campaign group said expecting cancer patients to wait two months for their first treatment could, in some instances, be a death sentence. The strain and stress this will put on people is immense. She added, the CCG say they wanted our health care to be equivalent to what it is on the mainland, but this won't happen if we have these kinds of delays. A spokesman for the Isle of Wight National Health Trust said, the figures for April 2017 to March 2018 show we achieved all our targets for the treatment of patients with cancer, apart from cancer patients being treated within 62 days of referral. The ability to consistently meet the 62-day cancer standard is part of the national challenge. The Trust is reliant on Portsmouth and Southampton hospitals to provide specialist imaging and diagnostic tests for island patients. The Trust is working with the CCG and the two mainland centres to improve access to these tests and reduce current waiting times. It should be noticed that there has been a significant increase in patient referrals locally and within the Wessex region for the specialist services provided by Portsmouth and Southampton. The Trust is being supported by the National Health Service Improvement to identify other areas for improvement to further reduce patient delays and work towards full complements with the National Council target compliance, sorry, with the National Council targets. And there's a little further short article, Chance to Quiz Health Chiefs. Tickets are still available for an important question time style event on the future of St Mary's Hospital. And people still have time to submit their questions in advance of Monday's free event at which islanders, politicians and community groups will have the chance to quiz health bosses. The County Press and Isle of Wight Radio will be reporting live from the meeting at Cowes Enterprise College from 6pm. 11% of St Mary's Hospital services look set to be transferred to the mainland within three to five years. Most patients requiring urgent or specialist care could be treated off-island, while routine procedures currently carried out at mainland hospitals could be brought back to St Mary's. And tickets are available from the County Press and Isle of Wight Radio. And for the last of the headline articles, Hospital Errors Led to Man's Disability a cow's man has been awarded £1.5 million in compensation after a misdiagnosis at St Mary's Hospital left him permanently disabled. Matthew Smith, 53, was left with a devastating spinal injury and unable to work or even walk around his house without constant pain after his treatment at the hospital was delayed by three days. In January 2013, Mr Smith, a former lecturer, slipped on ice and twisted his back. 
A few days later, he found he was unable to walk. I crawled back to bed, but it felt like I had spiders running up and down my legs, he said. After he lost feeling and movement in his left foot, he took a taxi to the hospital. A few hours later, the doctor sent him home with muscle relaxant diazepam. Overnight, Mr Smith struggled to pass urine and felt numb from the waist down. The next day, Mr Smith's GP visited for a pre-arranged visit and suspected he was suffering from Corda Equina Syndrome, or CES. However, Mr Smith said when he returned to the hospital, it was not until the following day he was given an MRI scan, confirming the diagnosis. Mr Smith was not transferred to the spinal unit at Southampton General Hospital until 11pm that night, and surgeons did not operate until the following day. By this time, it was too late to prevent permanent damage. Now, Mr Smith, a former triathlete, spends much of his time in a horizontal wheelchair and must spend most of his time on his back or risk being in agony. He said, The first doctor I can excuse. He did not know what he was dealing with. I could see he was concerned, but he still sent me home. But the window of recovery was still there. If the second doctor had acted on the GP's advice quicker, I would have been OK. Ankharad Hughes, a spinal injury specialist at JMW Solicitors, who handled Matthew's case against the two hospitals, said, In Matthew's case, there was a clear lack of awareness of the signs of CES by hospital doctors and the need to arrange an urgent MRI scan and surgery. This meant he waited three days before he had surgery and by the time it was done, it was too late to prevent permanent damage. Mr Smith now campaigns for greater disability disability access across the Isle of Wight and in 2015 launched a national campaign calling the government to tackle the discrimination experienced by those living and working on UK islands. A keen swimmer, in 2014 he completed the Sandown to Shanklin peer-to-peer swim, raising money for the Ellen MacArthur Trust. However, he said, I would I would it give all the I would give all the compensation back and they could take my house too if I could not get my if I could get my legs back. All of it. I think it's important for people to challenge the NHS when they make mistakes. To know I would have made a good recovery if it had been treated as a surgical emergency is extremely difficult to come to terms with. I believe mine and other recent cases brought against St Mary's has led to them making considerable investment and improvement to the A and E department. An Isle of Wight NHS Trust spokesperson said, We're very sorry we did not correctly diagnose Mr Smith at the time and were not able to undertake an MRI scan at St Mary's. Mr Smith was transferred to Southampton General Hospital within two and a half hours and Southampton subsequently operated on Mr Smith the following day. We hope Mr Smith can now move on from this difficult experience and we wish him all the best. And now we come to the rest of the paper. Plans appeal lost. A planning inspector has ruled against Ride School's plans for a three-storey boarding house on its grounds. The Isle of Wight Council Planning Committee refused permission for the plan in August last year and the school in Queen's Road lodged an appeal. However, the National Planning Inspector upheld the decision despite council officers recommending the plans were approved at the time. The authority recently granted permission for an alternative fallback scheme for a boarding house which included changing to its changes to its design. The original plan would have provided accommodation for 68 pupils and staff. 
However, members of the Council Planning Committee were concerned the design of the building was at odds with the surrounding conservation area. Rachel Wormsley, an inspector appointed by the Secretary of State, said in her report released yesterday, that's Thursday, the proposal would fail to preserve the character and appearance and thus the significance of the conservation area. I have found the public benefits would not outweigh this harm and so the proposal would conflict with policies. In the appeal, Ride School's planning agent Martha James stated the plan was highly sympathetic to the scale and materials of other buildings in the area. She said, with most properties orientated to face the Solent, the new building of three storeys some distance from the sea fund would barely be noticeable by most residents once the tree planting proposed in the application became mature. The original plan attracted 53 objections from residents who set up a protest group. Women in Volcano Zone the day after landing in Guatemala during the trip of a lifetime to Central America, two friends from the Isle of Wight found themselves in the middle of a disaster zone. When the Fuego volcano erupted on Sunday, sending molten rock streaming down the mountainside and burying surrounding villages in volcanic ash and mud, Nita Lillywhite and Naomi Cooper teamed up with fellow travellers at their hostel to help the relief effort. The whole hostel came together. Fourteen of us went to three different villages. We raised £1,500 for food from everyone contacting their friends and family, Nita told the county press this week. Naomi stayed to cook and make sandwiches while I went with a team of volunteers to take supplies and aid to the villages. A whole bunch of us are going to the hospital to give blood. Guatemalan officials say the death toll has reached 99 and around 200 people are missing following the disaster. More than 1.7 million people have been affected and more than 3,000 evacuated from their homes. Nita said she did not realise how serious the situation was at first and when the reality hit her, she did not have time to be scared. The volcano is about 25 miles from the city. I was walking through the town thinking it was raining until I realised it was volcanic ash, she said. We were confused about what was happening. We could see the volcano erupting from our hostel roof and raining volcanic ash on us. I was walking through the streets, caked in ash, trying to make sure everyone was safe. It wasn't until the next morning when my parents and friends were checking I was safe that I realised how serious it was. Public transport was cancelled and in the chaos on the streets, Nita saw a woman going into labour due to the trauma. She was just 27 weeks pregnant. They couldn't take her to hospital as there was no room. It was full of victims lying on the floor so they had to send her to a shelter. It was heartbreaking, said Nita. I'll never know what happened to her. Both Nita and Naomi, who have been travelling the world together for the past 12 years, work in healthcare. Nita, 38, of Priory Road, Carisbrook, is a cook at Westview House, Totland, and Naomi, 34, of Pan Meadows, Newport, works for the Isle of Wight Clinical Commissioning Group. Star-struck brothers in dreamland. Meeting a host of football legends has further inspired two brothers. Spurs fans Jacob Knowles, 7, and Josh Knowles, 14, travelled to Wembley to see England play Nigeria and the FA Cup final. They met 1966 World Cup hat-trick hero Sir Geoffrey Hurst, Rio Ferdinand, Frank Lampard, Paul Merston and Dennis Wise. 
They went with their mother, Sandra, after being invited to VIP events through Hillbands Pest Control, of which Sandra is director and Club Wembley. Sandra says, Both days were amazing. We were treated like stars. Sir Geoffrey Hurst was so accommodating, signing football shirts and programmes for the boys. Both boys were totally starstruck by meeting him. This was Jacob's inspiration, as he wants to be a striker. Joshua plays in defence, and he was overwhelmed to meet Rio Ferdinand. He was amazed by his height. Joshua plays for West White under-14s, and Jacob trains with the under-7s, and the family live in Carisbrook. Joshua attends Christ the King's College and Jacob Newport Church of England Primary. The chips stuck up for Janet. Cow's chippy favourite, Janet Wilson, is still chipper after 35 years in the job at Corrie's Cabin. Starting the role in 1983 as a part-time temporary position, Janet has now served about 600,000 customers fried chips that weigh as much as three jumbo jets and prepared more than 10,000 of her special pea fritters. She's also wrestled a man out of the shop, served several famous faces and had a man appear at the window wearing only a sock. <laughs> Janet said, I really enjoy coming into work and seeing my regulars and new faces. Over 35 years, fish and chips have pretty much stayed the same. It's everything else that's changed. No more yesterday's newspapers, a lot more card payments. I nearly grabbed a, a man's arm the other day as I thought he was trying to attack me. He was just paying with his watch. <laughs> Owner of Corrie's Cabin, Richard Quigley, said, Janet really is a treasure and we are very lucky to have her. I have banned her from even thinking about retirement. <laughs> <laughs> More than 1,500 empty homes on the island. More than 1,500 Isle of Wight homes are sitting empty. In October last year, when the most recent count was taken, there were 1,820 vacant homes on the Isle of Wight, <clears throat> one in every 38 houses in the area. Of those, 679 were classed as long-term vacancies, meaning they had been unoccupied for at least six months. The problem of empty homes on the island has improved in recent years. In 2008, when the number of vacant properties peaked nationwide, there were 2,586. Polly Neat, Chief Executive of Housing Charity Shelter, said, Making sure properties were occupied was just part of the answer to the country's housing shortage, she said. In the midst of a homelessness crisis, it is of course frustrating to see houses left empty. But the fact is that even if we filled every one of these, there still wouldn't be nearly enough homes to solve the problem. Figures show 260 new homes were built on the island last year. In total, 321 new homes were created, including those converted from office blocks or houses split, split into flats. A spokesman for the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government said the number of long-term vacant dwellings in England is still lower than when records began, but we are determined to bring this figure down. That is why we are equipping councils with, councils with tools they need to tackle the issue head-on, such as bringing forward legislation that will allow them to double the rate of council tax on those homes left empty for two years or longer. Island voluntary groups get Queen's Award. The equivalent of an MBE has been awarded to four voluntary groups on the island. Northwood House Charitable Trust, the Isle of Wight Food Bank, Needles National Coast Watch 
and Ability Dogs for Young People Isle of Wight have been honoured with the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. The recipients are announced each year on June the 2nd, the anniversary of the Queen's coronation. The island groups are among 250 across the country to be recognised. They will receive their awards from the Lord Lieutenant of the Isle of Wight, Major General Martin White, later this year. He said the awards demonstrate the outstanding quality of voluntary groups on the island. Tracy Crouch, Minister for Sport and Civil Society, said, Everyone who has received this award should be incredibly proud. If you know any organisations that deserve to be recognised, make your voice heard and nominate them for next year. Hannah King, Isle of Wight Food Bank Manager, said, It is an honour to receive this award on behalf of the 200 plus volunteers involved in the food bank. While the need for our support exists, it is really important to have such a dedicated team of volunteers. Our teams across the island work hard to ensure emergency food is available to everyone referred and create a welcoming environment for people to sit and have a chat over a cup of tea with a friendly face. None of this would be possible if it were not for people across the community who generously continue to donate food, time and funds. Thank you so much for all of your support. Tip opening hours blamed for fly tipping. Two thirds of people surveyed believe that there's a problem with fly tipping, with most blaming reduced access to waste recycling centres. More than 700 people responded to the Isle of Wight Green Party online survey. More than 300 fly tipping incidents have been recorded in 2017 to 18 prompting the Isle of Wight Council and Keep Britain Tidy to launch a new campaign, Crime Not to Care. The campaign aims to educate islanders that even if they give their waste to a third party to dispose of, they can still be prosecuted. The survey shows only 7% felt illegal collectors were to blame for fly tipping, with most blaming reduce access to the tip inconsiderate people and the cost of collection and disposal. <clears throat> Fisherman campaigns over drugs co conviction. One of the Freshwater Five fishermen convicted of trying to smuggle cocaine with a street value of £53 million into the UK has spoken publicly for the first time and vowed to clear his name now he is out of jail. Scott Bertwistle, 28, originally from Selsey, was living on the island at the time of his arrest. He was one of the five men known as the Freshwater Five who were sentenced to a total of 104 years in prison with three of the others coming from the island. Jamie Green of Yarmouth and fellow islander Jonathan Beer of Ryde, who was not part of the crew, were each jailed for 24 years while another island man, Daniel Payne, received an 18-year sentence. Crewman Zoran Dresik was also convicted. Mr Bertwistle was sentenced to 14 years for his part in the crime, but after being released from Rochester prison, he held up a poster proclaiming, six years and nine months in prison for a crime I did not commit and still no justice. He continues to protest his innocence several months on. He said, There is no proof or even facts. I have lost the last seven years of my life for literally nothing at all. They found cocaine, but they didn't know whose it was, where it had come from. We were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I can't imagine what some of the other families are going through. I will continue campaigning no matter what. Speaking on the BBC's Victoria Derbyshire programme, he added, Surely if I was guilty, I would just let it lie and serve my time. Why would I keep fighting now I've been released from prison? What would be the sense in that? 
The men were accused of picking up rucksacks containing the cocaine in the middle of the English Channel before dumping them overboard in Freshwater Bay for someone else to collect. Scott is represented by legal charity the Centre for Criminal Appeals. His solicitor, Emily Bolton, legal director of the centre, told the programme, even the experts testifying were not given access to all the information that they needed to get it right, to present a complete picture. So the experts themselves were misled, the jury were misled, the judge was misled, and in the end, the Court of Appeal has the opportunity to put this right. The jury was told the fishing boat went behind the container ship and picked up the sacks of cocaine. We can now show that that was not the case. We can also show where the sacks of cocaine were said to have been thrown off the fishing boat in sh inshore was a position the fishing boat did not enter and could not enter according to her own navigational device. Legal charity, the Centre for Criminal Appeals, is preparing to lodge a fresh appeal on behalf of the men. And with that, <clears throat> we're to say goodbye to you. Have a lovely weekend. Maybe the weather will be brighter. Bye-bye from Imelda. And bye-bye <clears throat> from Madeline. Hello, I'm Stephen. Hello, I'm Jan. And we'll be reading the letters and features section of the County Press for you this week. Starting off with a letter from Wilhelmina Hagenau of Bembridge, headlined, Why Can't People Simply Take It Home? I took the attached photograph, which shows an overflowing rubbish bin, at Yaverland Beach this morning, the Monday after a sunny Sunday, and this is just a very small amount of all the litter that was flying across the car park. Is it me or is Britain getting dirtier? Why can't people not take their litter home when the bin is full? Surely it's not rocket science to understand it will go everywhere, with birds and foxes in the neighbourhood. Undoubtedly, someone will blame the council for not putting out sufficient bins, but I feel that we, as people, should take responsibility for our own rubbish and take it home if it does not fit in the bin. That way, we keep the island tidy and enjoyable for everyone. And the UK needs to follow the island in investment in its roads. And this is from Paul Knocker of Bembridge. I think island roads deserve some credit for the work they have done to improve the roads in and around Bembridge. They have done a remarkable job over the past two years and most of the work was done at night to avoid disrupting the traffic. The only disappointment is that they ignored my request to complete a short stretch of the missing footpath on Lane End Road to improve, improve safety for pedestrians and slow the traffic before it was resurfaced. Of course, the big question is how has this been funded? Councils across the country have criticised years of underfunding for local road improvements and for dealing with potholes. There is an estimated £9.3 million repair backlog. The Transport Minister in a recent Times interview admitted, We probably have not spent enough on roads in this country since the 80s. The system as a whole is now ranked 27th in the world for road quality, despite some of the highest road and fuel taxes. The number of vehicles licensed for use on our roads has doubled since the mid-1990s. According to the DFT, 37.7 million vehicles were licensed last year too many cars chasing too little road space, with a huge hidden cost of congestion, particularly for commercial vehicles. Fuel duty and vehicle excise duty provide the Treasury with around £40 billion a year, but only about £7 billion is reinvested in the road system. The country urgently needs, to, needs infrastructure investment with a realistic action plan 
to catch up on roads, rail and airport capacity to compete in the world and improve the prospects for growth, jobs and prosperity. And now a letter from Molly Dodd of Newport, headlined, Our Historic Harbour is Such a Wasted Resource. I'm afraid I have one gripe on this warm Sunday morning. I was walking along the harbour wall in Newport, full of boats and visitors engaging the scenes. A couple from one of the boats asked us if we knew how to obtain a shower. This was 10.30, and everything was locked up, including the decrepit-looking public toilets. I felt so ashamed. Despite all the barriers at the entrance from Sea Street, an historic harbour could be an attraction. To see it like this is a huge disappointment, and I haven't even mentioned the overgrown flower beds. Why has this been allowed to happen? Why can't the Riverside Centre Cafe open for tea or coffee, or maybe a glass of wine on the harbour master side of the river? What a waste of revenue. And why are Green Party so pro-European? This is from Ian Mackay of Totland. The Isle of Wight Green Party is to be congratulated for its decision to select a candidate for the next general election now. There are rumours it may be as soon as October this year. Having a candidate in place now will give them a running start. What perplexes me though is their pro-EU stance both locally and nationally. Via the Industrial Emissions Directive, Europe's heaviest polluters were subsidised to the tune of £24 million, according to the NGO Carbon Watch in its 2016 report. Sorry, that was €24 million. Euros. Billion, billion euros. Uh, I'll read that bit again. <laughs> was subsidised to the tune of 24 billion euros, according to the NGO Carbon Watch in its 2016 report. The EU's linking directive paved the way for a 2 billion tonne overproduction of ozone layer destroying refrigeration gases according to the Environmental Investigation Agency. The same directive also directed, also generated an additional 600 million tonnes of carbon dioxide in Ukraine and Russia, according to the Stockholm Environment Institute. In January, Forestry Protection, NGO FERN, made the claim the EU's biofuels policy was damaging the climate and forests. If that was not enough, in April, Greenpeace said the EU's common agricultural policy was paying hundreds of millions into the pockets of the bloc's most polluting livestock farms. How can any of this be considered by any same metric, sane metric green? Finally, they may wish to consider the United Nations report of 2014, which stated, as reported in The Guardian, EU fishing deals with African nations were directly threatening the livelihood of 1.5 million local fishermen and could be creating an ecological disaster. Now a letter from Neil Blues of Ride, headlined Stars of the Future, on menu at Brilliant Jazz Weekend. I'm just back from the Newport Jazz Weekend, where we have been delighted by this year's eclectic mix of music and vocal artists and great performances. Well done to Jim Thorne and your team for providing us with so much joy. I especially enjoyed the up-and-coming artist Sarah Dowling, who has such a beautiful voice, and then the Isle of Wight Youth Jazz Orchestra, who have proved that they are capable of growing into the next generation of easy-to-listen jazz musicians. I would like to extend our thanks to the County Press 
Red Funnel and the other sponsors for helping to keep jazz alive on the island. He is looking forward to next year's Jazz Weekend. And from Mrs B Adamson of Freshwater, my thanks go to the person who handed my purse in at the counter of Co-op Post Office Freshwater on Wednesday last week. I have made a donation to Mountbatten by way of thanks. Now, letter headlined Looking for My Sons, which comes from Ruplo Dudnath, that's spelled D U D H N A T H, and the address given is 14M Chateau Margot, East Coast Demerara, Guyana, South America. And there's a telephone number provided, which is 592 220. 1695. In desperation, I am seeking Islanders help. I have four sons living somewhere on the Isle of Wight, and I have not been in contact with them for the past 20 years. Could the county press assist me to make contact with them, please? I live in Guyana, South America. My contact details have just been announced. My son's names are Keith Dudnath, who's 38, John, who's 36, Michael, who is 34, and David, who is 23. I am 70 years old and ill current, and I am ill currently, and I would like to get in touch with them. And this is from Mrs M Matthews of Newport. June the 14th is Compassion in World Farming's Stop Live Transport International Awareness Day. The Isle of Wight Support Group will be in St James's Square in Newport next Saturday, June 16th, campaigning against this cruel trade where farm animals are sent on long distance journeys, often in appalling conditions, to their place of slaughter or for fattening. And now the looking back column, starting with events of 100 years ago on June the 8th, 1918 when one name on the King's birthday honours list was regarded with special pleasure by Islanders. Sir Harry Thomas Hatt, the ex-mayor of Bath and an esteemed Newport resident, was awarded a knighthood. He was a member of the Newport Debating Society and a fond name within the town. And also, a sad fatality occurred at Springvale Bay, when a seven-year-old girl drowned. Mildred W. Grant had been boarding at St Leonard's in Springvale when she had gone into the sea. Residents went into the sea to try and find her, but had no luck. And 75 years ago, that was June 5th, 1943, a young bus driver who joined the RAF Volunteer Reserve became a squadron leader just three years later. This was the third prim- promotion for Mr R. H. G. Boosie of Newport, who was formerly a conductor with Southern, Southern Vectis. The statement said, Flight Lieutenant Boosie has displayed courage and coolness of a very high order. And also 75 years ago, the fire service were called to a fire in Shalfleet Church Hall after two men walking home from Newport in the early hours spotted the blaze from two miles away. It started in the kitchen, which was on a wooden structure and spread uh, to the wooden roof. A piano and chairs were saved, but the hall was unusable. And 50 years ago, on June 1st, 1968, an island nurse was extremely successful in her training at Chichester School of Nursing at the Royal West Sussex Hospital. Not only did she receive her SRN certificate, but received the third year prize, the Hospital Theatre Prize and the Morley Prize for Medicine. The problem of providing an accurate definition of the island's hovercraft was raised in the House of Commons for a second time. Island MP Mark Woodnut said he was concerned about the accuracy of the definition as it excluded the SRN6 hover used on the Isle of Wight. After discussing with experts, he put forward a definition from the British Hovercraft Corporation. A hovercraft is an air cushion vehicle. 
and 25 years ago, June the 4th, 1993, residents of St Cross Court off Crocker Street, Newport, spoke of their courage, uh, out, sorry, their outrage after a mass execution of their trees. Medina Housing Association defended the decision to cut down around 30 trees and said they would have eventually killed each other. However, one resident said he was furious he hadn't been consulted or even told about the change. And also, 25 years ago, four crew members were airlifted to safety from the salvage barge Weapon 4 after it was swept aground by gale force winds off Ventnor. The barge, which had been working on the removal of the seaward end of Ventnor Pier, had anchor cables broken. The crew was lifted to safety. And ten years ago, on June the 6th, 2008, islanders mourned the death of two former Shanklin hoteliers who were killed in a horrific freak accident in France. The former owners of Rose Glen Hotel died when their car's handbrake failed. Friends and family paid tribute to the beloved couple. Also, it was announced the Freebay Festival goers would be allowed to line the Riverside Park during the Isle of Wight Festival, despite concerns from the organisers. John Giddings said, We believe there are health and safety issues. Isle of Wight Council leader David Pugh said the site should remain open with extra steps to ensure safety and good order. And also 10 years ago, a new composting facility was opened at White Salads. Spinner, Spinner's Sue Stark, there's a picture here of Sue Stark and Jan Organ, looked sheepish trying to spin yarn from the plastic flock made of recycled polycarbonate by Steve Gale of East Cows. And now the White Memories column. Headlined Great Pop Festivity in Hell Field. With the 50th anniversary of the first Isle of Wight festival being marked at this year's event, Ray Folk, the organiser of the original Isle of Wight festival, tells his story of staging the first event in 1968. His words are taken from notes from his book, Stealing Dylan from Woodstock, and from an interview with Alan and Tom Stroud. There was quite a team of us, but primarily it was my brother Ronnie and I who spearheaded the thing. I had worked at the county press on a five-year apprenticeship and left there at 21, just 18 months earlier, to set up my own printing business, and I was running it when the festival idea emerged. There was no indoor swimming pool on the island, and there was a campaign to raise money for one, and the idea of a festival came up. Unfortunately, the fundraiser, the Swimming Pool Association, started getting a lot of publicity which they didn't like, and they cut us loose, but allowed us to retain the £750 investment they'd put in. Investment which we paid back after the event. We were introduced to the farmer who owned Hell Field, Jimmy Flux. He only wanted £30 for the rental of the 40-acre barley field, which he would harvest the week before the festival. Appropriately, we knew it would be hell, and we would be dealing with stubble and soil with sharp bits poking out. It was also a very unsuitable location, because it was quite a trek to get there. Once the project got underway, all hell was let loose with ferocious opposition, but the event was just a few weeks away, so there was no time for opponents to gain an injunction. Ronnie scored the NME, and it came to light the American Underground Act, Jefferson Airplane, was playing in Britain that summer, and were looking for one more date. So an agreement was made they would headline for a fee paid in advance of £1,000. That's £20,000 in today's money. Second on the bill would be the crazy world of Arthur Brown, and also booked were The Move, Plastic Penny, Pretty Things, Tyrannosaurus Rex, Ainsley Dunbar Retaliation and the Fairport Convention, with John Peel as compere. We now had an event but the £750 wouldn't pay for all the groups. However, we were able to borrow £1,000 from Malcolm Gold, 
a kind friend from Freshwater Youth Club days who had just received a payout on leaving the army. We contacted the Isle of Wight's police chief, Superintendent Padden, who was very friendly, but pointed out a blunder in our county press advert which proclaimed that there would be beer tents. We hadn't yet obtained a licence to sell alcohol, and he warned our application would very likely be turned down as the licensing magistrates were up in arms about the festival. The solution was for a genuine licensed trader to apply for a licence on our behalf, and it came to light the proprietor of the Ride Castle Hotel was desperate for money. Ronnie paid her a visit, and for a fee of around £100, she took on the concession on our behalf. Two flatbed trucks from British Road Services made the stage. Scaffold poles were rigged together to create an arch and plastic sheeting covered the sides and back. Ronnie's approach approached Ronnie approached electrician Harry Garrod, who had a little shop in Carisbrook and knew all about electrics for large scale events. The field was beautifully lit with the whole arena illuminated by vivid floodlights. Harry did us proud. Southern Vectis, on the other hand, was singularly unhelpful and wouldn't provide buses to the site. It went smoothly enough. It was a bleak event, as I recall. The weather wasn't very warm. The attendance not as great as we'd hoped. We only had 10,000 or 15,000 people and most of them were probably from the mainland. Facilities were pretty threadbare. The men's toilets were a trench with a bit of fencing in front and the catering was just a few hot dog vans. Concessions for food were let out to Mengelas which was then undercut by rogue dealers who had somehow got on the site free. Hostile locals cut the telephone cable to the site and they also turned around uh, some of the festival signage, creating difficulties for travellers. On the Saturday afternoon, rainbow-coloured youngsters massed in the cold, spiky field for the night's event. Unfortunately, there is very little to look at in the archives. The move had, the move had horrendous problems. Nine of their speakers blew up, owing to them playing incredibly loudly and the two power sources blew up backstage, the blew up backstage gen generators were quite literally in flames, unable to handle the load. The night was saved by Jefferson Airplanes equipment, including their superior speakers, which were used instead. As one half of Tyrannosaurus Rex, Mark Bolan delivered his quavering lyrics and to illustrate fire, Arthur Brown donned something like a pie dish strapped on his head and on fire. Jefferson Airplane began their show at around 2am and were followed by the remaining bands. I remember Jefferson Air Airplane's light show, the amazing circles of colour whizzing around. On the evening after the festival, there was a party at Yarmouth Youth Club to celebrate its successful execution. The £750 stake from the Swimming Pool Association was paid back and it transpired in the days that followed the festival had lost money between £500 and £1,000. It was a huge loss by today's standards. No money at all came in from London ticketing outlets. One large source of loss was the Beatles Apple Boutique, then in the process of its infamous collapse. As for the ticket agencies, they never passed on the monies from ticket sales. It was a complete rip-off. Without these defaults, the festival would have made a good profit. However, 
we were decided upon another festival the next year and this time we were set to do it properly. Ray Fawkes's full account of the 1968 and 69 festivals can be found in his book Stealing Dylan from Woodstock, published in 2015 by Medina. And now the My View column, the first of which is from Jonathan Young, which is headlined Beware the Gate Crashing POTUS, that's President of the United States. Our American cousins don't do protocol particularly well, and next month's hole in the corner visit by their chosen leader is providing the government mandarins and royal flunkies with more than the usual assortment of trivial nonsense to worry about. Adding to the unpredictability of the day is the need to keep nasty troublemakers, feminists, green activists, mayors of London, you know the sort of people, from finding out until it's too late where Donald Trump is going and who he's going to see. Being divided as we are by a common language also doesn't help. The Donald's Royal Rendezvous had, I understand, to be hurriedly relocated from Sandringham to Scotland, after Fox News mentioned ladies-in-waiting and the Norfolk Broads in almost the same breath, setting the presidential mind on a most unfortunate path. And what has all this got to do with the Isle of Wight? Well, quite a lot actually, because another thing the Americans, and their presidents in particular, don't seem to understand is that if you're going to turn up a wedding, you have to be invited. And the dates chosen for old Orange Face's visit to these shores coincides with that announced many months ago, by the way, for the UK wedding of the year, well, nearly, that of my own dear daughter. Messrs Clinton and Obama have both in their time shamelessly stolen the show at someone else's big day for the sake of a photo op. Mr Shameless himself, still smarting at his exclusion from Megan Mania, the highlight, that wonderfully full-on address by the Episcopalian Bishop Michael Curry, won't willingly pass up on an opportunity like this one. I've tried to convince him it's not going to be his scene. For example, the reinforcement of the patriarchy, symbolised by one man giving a woman away to another man, is to be rejected in favour of a sort of family bimble down the aisle. We'll also be doing our bit, and guests will be expected to share this ethos towards saving the planet. Plastic is, of course, the big no-no. And to this end, the bride and her mother have recently been clambering around in the neighbour's stream in their wellies, collecting fallen rhododendron petals for drying and preserving for use as confetti. Also, we are huge fans of Ed Miliband in this family. Sometimes we even wear the mask. Our mate, Ed, don't like climate change deniers, so we don't like climate change deniers either, Mr Potus. Okay, fella? You have to go on Twitter to get through to Donald, but at least nowadays you get 280 characters. At real Donald Trump, I said. Young nuptials, not your comfort zone. Women making edgy speeches. Biodegradable confetti only. Carbon tax payable at door. Broads, still in Norfolk, HM the Q, gone Balmoral, Kim Jong-un, or golf, much better bet, hashtag nothing to see here. I'm not sure it's worked. In fact, I'm sure he'd have blocked me by now if some pesky witch-hunting judge hadn't told him he can't. I've briefed the bouncers and we are barbed-wiring the helipad. As a last resort, there's always Bishop Curry's sermon, suitably amplified on my 1970s ghetto blaster. It's what they do at Guantanamo. And also, in my view, uh, there's an article by Alan Marriott. Is society calling time on our pubs, he asks. It is certainly brave of an existing publican, Olive Olivia Tyler, to put her head above the parapet in the battle to save our drinking haunts. Olivia, who looks after the Union and the Globe in cows, has put her weight behind a petition in the wake of the closure of Peer View. Of the Peer View, this is another well-known hostelry in the town, presided over for more than a quarter of a century by Sue Westcombe, 
who finally flew, threw in the towel, saying being a tenant landlady these days was tough. She did not say as much, but hers seems a familiar tale of big pub companies wanting their pound of flesh from their inns and the market being unable to respond. Maintenance of these pubs is a grey area and I have heard tales of landlords being ha landed with big bills they simply cannot afford to meet. It is a shame the peer view, beloved of yachties and locals, currently has its doors shut. But does its calling time show a business problem or a greater one of a shift in society? The wonderful Isle of Wight heritage groups and our local authors can detail an era where cows ride Newport, Sandown and Shanklin all had a pub on every corner and villages such as Nettlestone and Chale Green had their own little inns. Some are still succeeding and when I pop into the Duke of York, also in cows, for a late refresher after football on a weekday evening, the place is busy with long-time mine host Barry Cass making sure everything is tickety-boo. But nowadays, pubs throughout the land are shutting at a rate of knots and the Isle of Wight is no different. With cheap supermarket booze and tough tenancy agreements being blamed for many of the closures. Do we need to look closer to home? Are we happier to have friends around to our houses than to pop down to the local for the evening? My late father had a regular pattern. A couple of pints on a Wednesday and Friday night out with my mum on a Saturday evening and a pre-Sunday lunch visit to the local. This was an era when pubs were very much a male bastion. These days work patterns have shifted and the social fabric has changed to make society much less male dominated, all probably to the detriment of the boozer, but to the betterment of our culture. I wish Olivia and all signatories to the petition well, as I like a good pub as much as the next man. However, it is a complex question whether we have any chance of retaining our pubs. And now the Behind the News column by Bill, Bill Bradshaw, headlined, When Times They Were A Changing. And that's news that plans are afoot now to celebrate half a century since the first Isle of Wight Festival. It's 50 years since the first Isle of Wight Festival, a time when the island and the UK was so very different from today and at the same time so very much the same. All White Now was launched earlier this month to mark the anniversary of that original festival and the two much bigger events in 1969 and 1970. It's a catch-all title, a huge nod to the times and Free's massive hit of the 1970 event. EWN's plan is to celebrate that extraordinary trilogy of festivals with three years of events, starting with a 1968 retrospective at the Cow Bar and Restaurant on Tapmo Farm on Sunday, on, sorry, on September 1st. They will shed reflective light on the heady days when the folk brothers from Totland, Ray, Ronnie and Bill, shook the island establishment to its foundations and thrilled the younger generations with a vigour and exuberance never seen since. It is not, says All White Now Chairman Andy Knight, a commercial enterprise, but an important commemoration of the spirit of those original festivals and the spirit of the times. There will be events this year at Tapnell Farm on September the 1st to mark the 1968 anniversary, with plans to stage larger celebrations next year for 1969 and in 2020 for 1970, perhaps on the nearby 1970 festival site itself if this year's inaugural event is a success. We aren't competing with the modern Isle of Wight Festival or any of the other gatherings, said Andy. What we're about is commemorating those original festivals, the spirit of those events and their legacy. 
We're fortunate to tie in with Tapnell Farm, who have bought into the whole ethos. They get what we're about, and it is great for the site for the first event this year, marking the 1968 anniversary, overlooks the 1970 festival site. But what were those times like in the late 1960s and the dawn of the 70s? What was the backdrop to the Folk Brothers' first foray in 1968, the Great South Coast Bank Holiday Pop Festivity? 1968 was a year of serious unrest, if not revolution. As Bob Dylan, who would famously headline the 1969 Isle of Wight Festival, observed, the times they were a-changing. Indeed they were. With the end of empire in the UK, assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy in the US where there were anti-war riots and civil unrest. In London, the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square was hit by rioting. In August 68, just before the first festival, the last regular steam service ran on British Rail, between Liverpool and Carlisle. The island for once was ahead of the curve. Its last steam engines ran in 1967. Cars were the thing now, and in 1968, Ford launched a car that would become an icon, the Escort. As for the pop music, this was the era of the hippie. 1967 had been the summer of love, with the Beatles moving away from pop and into psychedelia with Sgt Pepper, while rock was baring its teeth with the rise of Eric Clapton's band Cream and the emergence in the UK of American powerhouse guitarist Jimi Hendrix. And so it was that a young Roger Simmons, now company secretary at Freshwater's Dimbola Museum and Galleries, made the trek from his home in Winchester to the island for the 1968 Isle of Wight Festival to be held overnight on August the 31st and September the 1st. On the bill were West Coast stars Jefferson Airplane, Tyrannosaurus Rex with a pre-pop version of Mark Bolin, the crazy world of Arthur Brown, DJ John Peel, plus The Move, Fairport Convention and The Pretty Things, among others. No one knew what to expect, said Roger. We hadn't been to a festival before. I set off and I knew I'd have to sleep overnight because the bands weren't due to start until after 6.30pm. My dad told me I should take a sleeping bag, and I was glad I did. It got quite cold. We got the ferry to ride, and none of us knew what to do. There was a sign that said buses to the festival and so we jumped on. No one knew where we were going and it seems we were heading to the middle of nowhere. They were actually heading for Ford Farm near Whitwell. When Roger got there, there was a field, a stage, a burger van and not much else. I was just impressed that Jefferson Airplane from the States were playing, he said. The crazy world of Arthur Brown were also high on the bill and Arthur's famous set piece was to set ablaze his headgear when he sang Fire. But he couldn't get it to work. There was no fire. However, Roger was not disappointed for long. When Jefferson Airplane were playing an excellent set, the fire duly arrived. Or rather, the smoke did. The burger fan called fire, <clears throat> and there was smoke pouring towards the stage, Roger laughed. They stopped playing because I think they were worried it would affect their light show. After a short break, Airplane returned and finished their set. And so Roger fell in love with the island and that first festival and the love affair continues. He has lived and worked here for years. The 1969 festival held at Wootton was massive by comparison catapulted into legend by the Fuchs by the Fuchs securing Bob Dylan who snubbed an invitation to play at Woodstock on his New York State backyard to appear on the island his first live appearance for three years he topped a fine bill including the Who Free the Moody Blues the Nice and Joe Cocker but even that was a garden party compared to the 1970 festival at Afton when the site, only decided on within a month of the event, hosted a multitude put at anything between 250,000 and 600,000. The throng descended on the festival 
to see Jimi Hendrix, Joan Baez, Miles Davis, Joni Mitchell, The Doors, The Who. Again, Family, The Groundhogs, Free Again, ELP, The Moody's Again, Donovan, Taste, Melanie and Chris Christopherson, among others. The island rouse, the island rouse, particularly between 1969 and 1970 festivals, with a cohort of opposition, determined stopped the 1970 event taking part, culminated in legislation barring nighttime congregations of more than 5,000. 5, effectively killing off the festival on the Isle of Wight for decades. The flame was dulled but never extinguished. The Fultz almost resurrected the festival in 1994 when Blur and Oasis were lined up to headline a Britpop-inspired return to Afton. But the Isle of Wight Council late in the day pulled the plug because it was feared essential services would be stretched to breaking point over the holiday weekend. Those 1994 plans were picked up by an inspired John Giddings, a veteran of the 1970 festival himself, who eventually got the ball rolling again in 2002. It has rolled on impressively ever since. Now Andy, Roger and co are determined to mark the 50th anniversaries of those blaze trailing festivals. The first, this year's 1969 retrospective, will be a modest indoor event at Tatnall Farm, a venue that overlooks the iconic 1970 festival site. The 2019 and 2020 events will stay in the Tapnell area and could move on to the 1970 site, depending on the reaction to this September celebration. The inaugural event in September is deliberately low key to reflect the modest nature of the original festival. The organisers have already booked Fairport Convention founder Ashley Hutchings who is bringing his trio to the island. The Fairports played the 1968 festival. Tickets are already on sale and more names are set to be released in the coming weeks. All White Now chairman Andy Knight, a veteran attendee of the 1970 event, said the three-year event had the support of both Ray Falk, co-founder of the original 1968 to 1970 events, and modern festival promoter John Giddings. Ray has expressed his support and John Giddings is very supportive too, he said. I must stress we are not in competition with the modern Isle of Wight festival. It's great to be able to announce the appearance of Ashley Hutchings for September, who Bob Dylan described not so long ago as the single most important figure in the history of English rock, folk rock. And we can now say that rising island band Nakamara, who are playing the 2018 Isle of Wight Festival, will be opening the 1968 celebration at Tapnall. Most names will follow and tickets are selling very well. With a glance towards 2019, the 1969 festival was a major step up with the capture of Dylan who turned his back on Woodstock to play the Isle of Wight. A crowd of 150,000 flocked to pay homage at Wooden. But the 1970 last great event festival eclipsed even that, with a massive throng put up between 300,000 and 600,000. 
they were there for a stellar lineup, topped by Jimi Hendrix's last ever performance and including Joan Byers, The Moody Blues, The Who, Jethro Tull, Free, Donovan, Joni Mitchell, Miles Davis, Rory Gallagher and Melanie. Andy said wherever possible the organisers were interested in booking artists who appeared in 1968-70. to 70. AWN have indicated it is possible the Dimbola Gallery's Isle of Wight Festival archive may be moved to Tapnell to create a more expansive and permanent exhibition of the 1968 to 1970 festival photography. At AWN's May launch even meeting, Chris Hewitt of CH Vintage Audio displayed a WEM mixing desk from the 1970s festival, saying, it would be brilliant to have some of the original artists playing through some of the original island festival equipment, playing through some of the original island festival equipment in 2009 and 2020 on the original site. And tickets for the 2018 event on September the 1st at Tatnall Farm are on sale, £18 plus booking fee. For more about the 1968 festival, see pages four and five of The Weekender. And now a brief look at what's on. I have got news that the Mountbatten Community Choir are giving a concert at Ride Methodist Church, Garfield Road, next Saturday, June the 16th, at 7pm. Entrance is free, with a retiring collection to be shared between the hospice and the church. And also in Ride, the Marina Bowls Club are holding an open day next Saturday, June the 16th, from 10am to 2pm, at the Esplanade in Ride. There will be qualified coaches on hand to help equipment to help. Equipment is provided and non-bowlers are most welcome. And that's all we've got time for this week. So we're going to say goodbye. It's goodbye from me, Stephen. And it's goodbye from Jan. Goodbye. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. When I left a special school for blind students many years ago now, I could tell you about the type of longbow used to beat the French at the Battle of Agincourt. I knew about the tonnage of ships leaving the port of Liverpool in 1882, and I had a rough idea what a logarithm was. Trouble is, I couldn't iron a shirt, I could barely boil an egg or peel a potato. But things are very different now in places like this. I'm at St Vincent's School for visually impaired students in Liverpool and the students eating their lunch here in the dining room are learning to fend for themselves in a way I never did. And place your finger into the jerk half because what happens is it won't overflow then. Pull it away from the tap when you've got enough water. Is that OK? Yeah. Hi, my name's Paula Beach. I teach cooking and nutrition and independence. We're standing in a kitchen which has got four individual kitchens. In each kitchen they've got their own sink, their own microwave, their own toaster. It's fully equipped for the child to work on their own. I've been taught how to use the one cup, but I am the best chef in the world. <laughs> You're starting from scratch. What are you trying to instil into the youngsters who've been here today? I think that people are frightened to let young people use, say, a hot oven or a grill. What I instil in the children is safe techniques at all times. But also, Peter, what I have to do from the beginning is show the equipment cold. I mean, if you've not actually touched these things you wouldn't wouldn't you a blind wouldn't person know. wouldn't know what they're like you wouldn't know and understandably as well at home they may be, be told to stay away from the iron because it's dangerous and they can hurt themselves so while the iron is cold i actually show them how it works joe has been having a go at it uh, with help from paula beach i'm just going to go over and see how he's getting on 
So basically, I'm just going in up and down movement and keeping your hand away from it so you don't burn your hand or whatever. Mm. You put the flex around your wrist. So can you explain what those are, Joe? The, the, what you're putting around your wrist? Okay. The, the, the flex, the, the, the wire, because then you're not ironing the, the wire, you're not... So you're not going to iron over the, yeah. over the yeah. flex? Yeah, over yeah. The flex. Which yeah. could be very nasty, I yeah. guess. Yes. If you burn through the flex, <laughs> all sorts of things could happen. Game over. Yeah. Game, Game over, yeah. <laughs> How sophisticated can you get with the things that you're teaching the children? Well, I do go up to a level of I'm doing a BTEC, Jamie Oliver course, where the children have to be able to cook for themselves. So it's a, it's a broad range. It starts, Peter, it could start from being able to make a cold drink to iron and to using the oven to being able to do a three-course meal. What's the ultimate aim, would you say? To make the children as independent as possible for when they go out either to college or eventually they may have their own home. That It'll give them confidence to be able to look after themselves. That's my biggest aim. I'm Angela Simpson and I'm Deputy Principal at St Vincent School. On a Wednesday afternoon we have enrichment, anything from ceramics to fitness to extra mobility, cooking and nutrition, but not national curriculum cooking and nutrition, more the fun sort of cooking and nutrition that you have to do to to survive. And we have not only our pupils, there are visually impaired pupils who come from local schools to access enrichment activities. I have heard it suggested that there's a need for independent living, rehabilitation, to be more a part of the curriculum, almost in a sense have part of the curriculum designed for them. And What's your view about that? Independence is something that we promote wherever they are. And even within the more academic lessons, independence will always be mentioned as well as their academic studies, they do need to be able to get the academic qualifications that they need to pursue the career that they have in mind. It's no good having a you know, handful of qualifications if they can't get themselves to work and they can't interact with the other employees and they can't get their lunch ready and go to wherever they need to go. It's, it's the whole person that we're trying to um, evolve, if you like, so that they've got all the necessary skills to to survive and succeed. You do have a broad range of education here and some visually impaired children may well say, I don't, I don't want to do all this stuff. I can get somebody to boil me an egg. I can get somebody to make me a cup of coffee. I want to learn history, English. Is this compulsory? It's not compulsory, no. If the, the enrichment is an opportunity for, for our pupils to try new skills. A lot of the areas of the enrichment will tie into national curriculum subjects anyway, so the ceramics can be will tie into the art. We do aquaponics, that will tie into science. We, there's a drama session, so that ties into drama and English. So all of the enrichment activities do tie into our curriculum and the, the subject areas. Well, I better get a bit of a move on because I understand that uh, Marcia is just about to have a mobility lesson that's kind of getting from A to B. She's due to go to the bus stop, catch a bus and go into town. Cheryl McKellen is her instructor. OK, Marcia, we're starting here on our tactile paving. OK, and what I want you to do is make your way to the end of the path and find the cobbles. OK. So that's a roller cane, isn't it, Marcia? A jumbo roller tip. Oh. It's just a bigger round ball at the end of your cane and what it tends to, it doesn't snag as much on uneven pavement so a lot of the students actually prefer these now. Right, so you found your blister paving so you know that that's indicating that you're road crossing now so do you want to position your cane ready to cross? You've got a bit of sight, Marcia. How much are you listening? How much are you looking? I struggle with my hearing. I have to utilise my sight as much as I can because my hearing can fluctuate and my sight can fluctuate quite a lot. So it could be that in the next couple of minutes my sight or changing my hearing will get better, so I have to rely on both of them to be OK. So when you're ready, Marcia, you make your decision to cross and make your way to the cobbles at the end of the path. As we make our way through the trees, obviously the trees above your head are blocking out the sun, so once you're through the trees it will become lighter, and again that's another clue for you to use that lets you know you're at the end of the path. 
so we're just catching up with Marcia because I got stuck on the other side of the road <laughs> Marcia was too quick for me. Okay Marcia, so what I want you to do now is find the landmark and then square off from it to find your down kerb. It's about the fourth road crossing in 400 yards, isn't it? It's almost been designed as an obstacle course. <laughs> It would have been handy if they'd moved this bus stop a bit nearer, but it wouldn't have been as good a challenge. Um, it's quite interesting for, for me watching Cheryl instructing Marcia because I'm only using a symbol cane. I must admit, I'd, I'd find this quite a challenging walk. It's just a lot of crossings and a lot of turnings in a very short space of time. So if you just want to come out of the bus stop for me, stand a little bit closer to the kerb and put your cane upright and out in front so that the driver can see you. The way we do this, if they have the cane out and it's visible to the driver, the drivers should stop with the doors opening as close to them as possible. Obviously we don't live in a perfect world and it doesn't always happen, but we try. So Marcia, we've got to the bus stop and your kind of next couple of challenges are now ahead, which is the bus and, and going into town. What are the tricky things about that? On the odd occasion, sometimes bus drivers will decide that they don't want to stop at bus stops, so then I'll lose count of how many bus stops I have to go until I get to the location I'm going to. It can be quite hard with noise on the bus as well sometimes, if there's children screaming, mm. adults shouting at the children and... When I was in, at school a long time ago, we, we just didn't get this training. We just went and picked it up as, as we went along, really. It, it was very haphazard. How we all survived, I'm not quite sure. How valuable do you find this kind of training? It allows us to have that extra little bit of independence and it allows us to be able to travel independently without having to have someone constantly there miring you or nagging you about going such and such a place you can go somewhere on your own any things you're looking to to do today you've done the walk anything that you particularly want to develop your skills at i'll be working on the likes of talking to the people at the counters and asking them for help and asking them to help me find things and on the bus asking them to tell me where we're going it's really interesting you mentioned that because you can learn all the skills in the world. But, I mean, one of the things I've found that got me out of trouble most often is being able to talk to people. So you, you still, although you're learning these skills, you, that is something you still value, is it? That, the, this confidence to actually ask for help when you need it. I struggle a lot with confidence with most things. So trying to find the confidence to talk to the people to get their help can sometimes be quite hard. Okay, so you've identified that it's the correct bus, okay? Mm-hmm. You have to find your way to the door. Here you go. Here you go. Thank you. Can you give me a shout when we get to Sainsbury's, please? Sainsbury's, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, bye. Bye. There she goes, off into town. probably hear the youngsters in the background getting their dinner. We're just going to walk into the dining room. Interesting change of surface there. It's one thing I've already noticed at the school, that there are a lot of different qualities of surface. And so as soon as you walk in here, it feels different. You know where you are. Angela Simpson again. We have a talking menu outside that the children can press the button and it will say what the, what's available for lunch each day so that when they come and queue up, they know what they're going to ask for. So it's a talking menu rather than a Braille menu, isn't it? It is, yes. We did used to have Braille menus, but the talking menu um, is quite popular. They just press the button as they're on their way in and it will tell them and it's updated every day to say what's on the menu. Yeah, and I suppose that is also something that everybody could access because not every child is going to find braille all that easy are they yeah exactly we used to have braille and large print menus on the wall um but sometimes you know by the time you found the menu and read it it's much easier just to know where there's a button on the wall and press it and you get the the menu okay let's uh, let's grab something to eat if we can i'm intrigued by this speaking menu so i'm going to give it a go there's a big round button on the wall i wonder what happens if i press this Today's menu is cheese pie, 
sausages, mash, cauliflower, broccoli, jack of potatoes, salad, fresh fruit and yoghurt. Right, I think I'll have the cheese pie. Thank you, madam. Some of the younger ones do take great delight in sometimes running past, past it during the day and pressing it Just to see if the menu's it. on. <laughs> this radiator here, when they trail the wall, mm-hmm. this radiator here, right. when they get to that, if they turn, do a 90-degree turn, yep. straight opposite them are the doors. Because right. I noticed going into the dining room, it was a complete... It's a wooden surface, so you notice it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's wooden in the dining room. Outside the dining room, it's a different floor. Mm. Here, it's vinyl tiles, and then when you go through the next double doors, it's carpet. Right, well, I'm just making my way down another school corridor here. And we're coming into another of those changes of uh, texture. Um, and this, I understand, is going to be called the Independence Suite. But... It's much more than that. It's, it's almost a microcosm of the community. Right, this was a, a large room, but we're dividing it into four sections. Two sections are going to be for pre-work experience placements. Mm. Because we've got a cafe on site, we're doing a mock cafe in here, which will allow the children to learn some skills. We've got an office area that's going to be set up and will be connected to the school office so they can learn some office skills before they go out on work experience. The rest of the complex, we've got a room which is going to be the lounge with a fireplace, sofas. We're going to have a bedroom, there is a bathroom and there is the kitchen. So really, actually, this is much more than a house, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a mixture of house, workplace, leisure space, cafe. You're almost trying to create a microcosm of life, aren't you? Well, yes, we are. And then we've got one more space that we're going to use. And at the moment, I'm thinking we're going to set it up for a, a careers section. This is much more than used to happen, isn't it? Without, I mean, without you being unduly modest, I mean, what, you, what you seem to be saying is we have to prepare visually impaired people for the, the whole of life, not just what was conventionally thought of as learning, if you like. Yeah, yeah we, we do. Uh, you know, um, we want to, to ensure that visually impaired young adults are part of, the, of society as a whole and not just somebody that people might treat with some trepidation, Mm. uh, might be a little bit afraid of how they should approach somebody who's visually impaired, and give our children the confidence to be able to go out into the the sighted world, as it were, to to show that they can do everything that everybody else can. Has this been expensive? Not really, not really. Um, I suppose irons don't cost too much. <laughs> you, no, you, you've put very ordinary things in here. We have put very ordinary things in. The only thing that I would say that is, is different than what you might find in an ordinary kitchen is a talking microwave. Door open. Door closed. Start. High power. One minute. I mean, what is striking me as I'm standing in the middle of all this with irons and sofas and uh, all that is, is how different this is to uh, when I went to school, which is you went from geography to history to maybe physics or whatever, and it just it didn't occur to anybody, really, that we should do all this. It does feel very different. And it does take a leap of faith to entrust your child to a school like St Vincent's. Well, I'm just about to meet someone who's done exactly that, Pam, who's the nan of head boy, Robbie Pennington. So, Pam, we've been talking about, the, in a way, that sense of risk that parents or guardians must feel when they, they entrust their children to a school like this, especially when they're doing things like, you know, messing about with hot fat, boiling kettles, all that sort of thing. I just wonder what your, your own reaction to that has been. Yeah, the risk is always there, no matter where you are. I feel quite comfortable um, when he's in the kitchen and using all of the skills that he's learned since he's been here. Did you always feel like that? Though? I'm just trying to ask you to cast your mind back to when you first knew that he was in the kitchen <laughs> messing about with hot water and fat and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, no, it was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, out my mind, like, oh, no, no. 
But just uh, as time goes on and everything, he, he sort of obviously he's supported and everything that he does. But it is what's well, a scary moment, isn't it? Even with a sharp knife. Were you were you letting him do those kind of things at, at home in your kitchen? No. <laughs> So, so, Robin, did you notice the difference? What is the significance of, of doing this kind of thing, the lessons that you learn here? I'm, I'm comfortable in a place like this, but at the same time, it's nerving, like when you're dealing with objects like knives or anything like that. I can get from, like, A to B if I have, you know, a cane, and I'm, you know, capable of getting daily things done, but I do still need obviously support in some things that my visual impairment makes me lack. What's clear to me from the time I've spent here is that today's visually impaired students are being taught living skills in a way that pupils like me had to pick up for themselves and which some of us never did. What maybe hasn't changed is that, as Marcia said, having the confidence to ask for help when you really need it is still a vital tool in leading a full life. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. Good evening. Tonight, getting around safely, we have new research about a method that's as old as the hills, and technology which links up with a human helper. There's a bench here on the right-hand side. You have a narrow path here, and then you're going to have a bag on the left and a man on the right, so a very narrow path here. More about something called IRA later in the programme. But first, many blind people who get around on their own are familiar with the phenomenon known as echolocation. Uh, Less so sighted people who um, see me flicking my fingers, clicking my tongue, and don't realise what I'm doing. I'm actually getting an echo of things. At its most basic, it's what bats do. They make noises and then use the echo you get back to stop bumping into things. But just how effective is it for human beings and can it be taught as opposed to just being picked up naturally? Well, In Touch has had first sight of some new research carried out at the University of Durham and we'll be hearing from the scientist who led the project in a moment. But almost exactly 10 years ago, I paid a visit to No Top Primary School in Motherwell near Glasgow where blind and partially sighted children at their visually impaired unit were being taught how to put echolocation into practice. Well, as someone who felt that uh, I'd picked it up almost subconsciously as a child, I was intrigued about how and why it was being taught. I want you to click to your left, to your right, and straight ahead of you. And by doing that, you have to tell me where the panel is, OK? Right. Once straight ahead. Perfect. OK. So what exactly is going on here? Well, the trainers, Alex and David, are holding up wooden panels in front of or to the side of the children, testing whether they can locate where the panels are by the sounds reflected from their clicking tongues or flicking fingers. Sounds a bit bizarre, I know, but as I said, many visually impaired people are familiar with the phenomenon that much of the information we get about where we are comes from using such techniques. Hi Jake, have you used this kind of thing before? Did you realise that if you flick your fingers or click your tongue that you'd get echoes? No, no, I didn't realise that. Do you get around on your own outside very much? Because you're not not all that old yet. What are you, ten? Ten. Do you walk about at all on your own outside? No, mainly I'm walking about the school, going to my class and going downstairs and things. Mm -hmm. I only really go about my own in the playground when there's nobody out like now. But for this to be useful, I, I guess what you'd really like is to be able to go in the playground yeah. with the other children, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Do you think you'll get to that point? Yes, I think I will. That's great. David Logan, you've been training Jake. Can you explain what point at the training you are? We're still quite early stages with Jake. This is really about the fourth or fifth session that we've had with him. And the area we're in just now, it's a small enclosed area, an, an alcove off the playground. Jake was aware that there were two doors and also one thing that, which he thought was a door but was actually a notice board. It's quite difficult to, to make that fine judgement at this stage. I think, like, like all training, like, like all education, you can actually make this fun. 
And if you make it fun, then the children enjoy what they're doing and they learn the lesson. You'll be aware that some people, I mean, I know obviously a lot of other blind people, and they're saying to me, and I'm saying, look, I've been doing this kind of thing since I was a kid, you know, yes. um, and no, I wasn't taught it. Yes, I think what we can do here is we can train people to do it more effectively. I suppose that's what worries people that, you know, in the, some of the coverage are phrases like revolutionary new technique and so forth, but it isn't, is it? Human beings have probably been doing this for tens of thousands of years. Well, what are you experiencing? In the left it's lighter, in the right it's more echoey. You think there's an optical in front of you? Yeah. Chat from the radio with a microphone in front of you, so yeah. can you tell the difference between the, the wall and the, and the person? Uh, there's a wee bit of difference, but I don't uh, know how to describe it. Well, what, well, what I would I would get would be very hard, sharp echo. That's how I would describe it. And off a person that's kind of soft and spongy. <laughs> that was very good. You picked that up. Will we head back along okay. the route, right, and we'll, we'll turn, turn you around again. Well, you heard Jake Murray there learning echolocation, age 10. We're going to speak to him later in the programme to see if he's using it age 20. And listening to that and joining me from Durham is neuroscientist and associate professor Laura Tala, who's been carrying out research which tries to pin down exactly what's happening when we echolocate. She explained that the way people clicked makes all the difference. So we have done a lot of research where we asked people just to make their own click and we found that people who make brighter clicks tended to do better. We used a loudspeaker to make the clicks, so we didn't ask people to make them themselves. And the reason we did it is that this way we had really good control. You know, we could basically from trial to trial sort of switch what the sort of click that people were then using. And then sometimes there was an object, sometimes there was no object, and the task was really simple. So they just had to say, yeah, I think there's an object in front of me. And then we just determined how accurate they were. So did you talk to blind people as well about how they used it and in, indeed how they were reacting to what you were doing? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we knew that they tried to make um, a sort of sharp clicking sound and that they feel that it, this is useful to them. Yeah. So what kind of things did people say about the way that they used it and how effective they thought it was? So in a practical sense, when we talk to people, they say, well, when they're using it in the moment, it gives them some additional information what's around them. And this can be something about, you know, useful, say, to avoid an obstacle at head level, for example. But it can also be in space that's further away, for example, out of the reach of the long cane or something which is, you know, too far, for example, for the dog. So it can be useful for the sort of larger scale orienting. Can you give us an idea of the kind of distances at which people could locate something and, you know, specifically say reasonably clearly what it was and and whether they could detect to which side of them it was and all those kinds of things? We have investigated distance up to three metres. That's not very far. But in other environments, like in other laboratories, um, people have investigated echolocation and people are very good at using it for detecting things that are like 32 or 64 metres away. As far as that? That that sounds quite a long way. You have to think about it, though, in the following way. So it's all a matter of scale. So if you're interested in quite a small object, that has to be a bit closer for you to, to detect it. Whereas if it's a very large object, like a large building, then it can be further away. So if you're looking at a high rise, that can be easy, 60 metres away, and, and people will detect that very well. Because there's a lot of it to get a bounce of, of sound yeah, off, basically. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what's however also something to keep in mind, even though there's a bit less research about this at this moment, which is published, but even at that distance, again, if it's a large building, you will not only be able to tell that there is something but depending on the surface structure of the building you can also tell a bit more about exactly what that surface structure is so for example if you have a building that's very flat and smooth on the outside as compared to a building that has say lots of balconies and and an internal structure it will sound different right well it's beyond my i I've, i thought i was quite good at echolocation but i've never <laughs> been able to do that in my opinion you will have to have come across something like this before so you'll have had the ability to build up that echo vocabulary or this echo knowledge so it's not something i think that is just 
you know. You see, this is why we were rather interested in your work, because some rather dramatic claims have been made on echolocation's Mm -hmm. behalf. People know that there are claims made for for Daniel Kish, for example, in films and in podcasts, where he says he can, you know, detect quite small objects. Uh, He rides a bike using this technique. Does your work support claims like this? We have not investigated bike riding. (laughs) (laughs) You've not. But I have. I mean, I, I do interact with... With people who use echolocation, Daniel is one of them, but there are also plenty of other people and they all have very different personalities, very different lifestyles. You know, Daniel has certainly gone on the record. There are some YouTube videos, whatnot, where he's shown riding his bicycle, but, but there are plenty of other people who wouldn't do that. And I think he, he would fairly say if he rides his bicycle, he'll do it in an environment that's not like busy traffic in London, for example, but mm. it's, you know, a road where echolocation, for example, gives you orientation. So I'd say, so there's a sensationalistic reporting going on at times mm. which which is actually a danger because people get unrealistic expectations and i mean echolocation is a very active process because you make your own clicks and you move you explore the space around you and that alone is something which i think is very engaging so people needn't feel embarrassed about it you think it's really quite enhancing <laughs> quite enabling to be able to do it yes since you mentioned it. <laughs> so let's say if there's a worry, you know, well, what will other people think of me? What they would also notice is that if you walk around very hesitantly, having an additional tool that allows people to walk confidently, deal in space confidently, actually, they'll stand out in an odd way much less. I'm quite proud of my clicks, I must admit. <laughs> Dr. Laura Tyler, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And if you're interested in knowing more and indeed maybe having a go at echolocation, Dr Tala's unit is holding workshops at the University of Durham and indeed in other parts of the country. Details on the In Touch page. And if you take a look at Radio 4's Twitter feed, you can find me taking an unscientific test with a dinner plate. Now, from something we've been doing for tens of thousands of years to a piece of kit which is new in America and about to be launched here. Ira combines the latest in smart technology with good old-fashioned human help. It's a pair of glasses with a camera between its lenses linked to a smartphone. BBC Washington correspondent Gary O'Donoghue, who uses a good deal of assistive technology, has been trying it out for our technology programme, Click. So Gary, how was it for you? I started off being a sceptic about uh, this service, but I think I was, I've was i become a bit of a convert to it because particularly the new technology they've introduced, the new devices they've introduced, have a, a significantly wider field of vision uh, and they've simplified the process a lot so it'll be a, you know, something that's available and useful to a lot more people who don't necessarily know how to use a smartphone and, and all its ins and outs. But it is a sort of strange sort of process of of sort of talking to someone, a disembodied voice who's who's telling you about your surroundings. Have a listen to this. This is Aaron Sanford, who was helping me out. It says, scan your document's barcode and go to the left just slightly and pause and select. Yeah, so this is actually the back of the receipt advertising for American Express. And now it's upside down if you'll rotate it. Okay, perfect. Hey, that's a, I mean, it takes a little while, but it's doable, isn't it? That's amazing. There's a bench here on the right-hand side. You have a narrow path here, and then you're going to have a bag on the left and a man on the right, so a very narrow path here. So just put that in context for us, Gary. What were you doing there? Well, there were two things there. The first task I was doing was actually uh, attempting to and succeeding in using one of the sort of touchscreen sign-in booths at an airport, something that's completely inaccessible normally, with the help of that agent there, you heard me uh, scanning my passport, you know, operate, operating the touchscreen and getting my boarding card out. And then the second uh, piece was me 
walking along the, the National Mall here in, in Washington, which I wouldn't dream of trying to do. Big open area with a great big lake in the middle. You know, I wouldn't dream of doing that <laughs> no, normally. It's scary, yeah. Uh, uh, but it was, it was doable and it was, it was quite liberating, really. Now, we already have apps uh, like Be My Eyes and uh, Tap Tap See, which also have got people online describing the world to us, which is kind of what we heard there. Why is this a step on from these? Well, you're right. And, the, and things like Be My Eyes have been enormously successful and they've done a, a fantastic job. Their model is slightly different in that they rely on volunteers, uh, unlike uh, Ira, which pays its agents. I think the difference with that is particularly that if you're dealing with a volunteer, then you can't necessarily expect to impose on them for more than you know a few minutes at a time. Whereas Ira, which you're paying for, uh, you can use as much as you want or as much as you're prepared to pay for. So there's that difference. I think my point about all these is that none of these, the usefulness of these other apps doesn't go away because of something like Ira. It's an addition to what's already avail- available. It's it's an extra tool in the toolkit. Now, you mentioned that they're not volunteers. So how expensive is it and how is it being paid for? It is expensive. Um, it's sort of modelled on that old system we used to have of paying for minutes like we used to do with our phone contracts. So a basic package here in the US is $89 for 100 minutes per month. Uh, and if you want to go up to the completely unlimited monthly uh, sort of arrangement, that's $329. Now, that's an awful lot of money for, for anyone, but it's a, certainly a lot of money for, for visually impaired people who are often out of work and, uh, as you know, are often you know, paid less than the average wages when they are in work. I put that point to Kevin Phelan, who's Vice President of Sales and Marketing at IRA. As we started to hear more about the financial concerns, we started to go to the businesses and say, these are your customers, can you start to uh, pay for the IRIS service? So what we then did is added the guest program. So again, today you can sign up as a guest for free and use it in places that you go. Would the big breakthrough be getting people like healthcare, health insurance companies to pay for it? Yeah, so, so we're active conversations now, you know, there's, there's uh, an estimated 300 million people globally that are blind and, and low vision, and, and we look at this as, as something where every one of them should have IRA in their hands and, and have this uh, ability to have instant access to information anytime, anywhere. And where could this technology take us? Where could it end up? I think the thing I take away from this is that there isn't a silver bullet. You know, we all know that most of the things we we have to achieve and do in life require a range of solutions. And IRA is certainly one of them. I think it's one of uh, an incredibly good one. And and I think that will increase that that range of of technology and applications and tools, as I mentioned earlier, those will increase and we'll just have to work out which ones work best for which tasks. Gary O'Donoghue. And uh, Gary's report is already available online. Just search for click on the BBC website. Now, earlier, we played a clip of me in uh, No Top Primary School in Motherwell speaking to Jake Murray. He was 10 and he was learning to echolocate. I was, like, using my echolocation click to go along walls and find corners and what direction to turn in and... You know this environment pretty well. Um, yeah. Have you tried using it yet somewhere you didn't know well? I went to Far Park School a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and I used it a couple of times in there just to see what the area was like. Right. Do you think this is something you will use as, as time goes on? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that was Jake, age 10. He's now 20 and uh, we found him. Uh, so, Jake, first of all, uh, what's it like to hear your former self? That sounds terrible. It doesn't sound like me at all. Uh, well, well, no, it doesn't, actually. It doesn't sound at all like you now. Um, Jake, just tell us, before I ask about echolocation, what are you up to now? What are you doing? Um, I'm currently working at the Citizens Advice Bureau in Motherwell, four days a week. I'm an uh, admin assistant and call handler. We heard you say there that you would use echolocation in that clip we played. Do you? No, I'm not. I'd hardly use it at all, to be honest. I think it was because when I was uh, 11 and obviously I went to... I went to the Royal Blind School as my high school and they didn't really use echolocation at all. I think they knew about it but didn't know about it, if that makes any sense. I suppose if, you, if you're going to use it at all, you need to kind of keep using it. Uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, Lord Tala was talking about the possible embarrassment of it. I just wonder whether that was a, ever a factor. In that clip, I was 10 and very sort of um, quite open to things. I mean, I'm still quite open to things, but 
as I kind of got older and gone through school and then I went to mainstream college for two years to study music, I was the only blind person in our class at college. So no one else did use that sort of thing, the echolocation. And I didn't kind of want people to think that I was kind of strange. So perhaps not the coolest thing, maybe, also when you're trying to chat someone up. No, you, you can't really chat up by clicking at them. It's not really... Do you think you might do it when you're older? I, I, I might. I, well, I said that the last time, didn't I? Ten years ago, the, the little boy said he would do it. So nothing's changed. We're still waiting for you to use it. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. And if you can cope with websites, you'll find more about everything on today's programme page, from where you can also download tonight's and many other editions of In Touch. To get more information and add your comments, you can also call our action line on 0800 044 for 24 hours after the programme. Leave us a phone number if you'd like us to be able to get back to you or you can email intouch at bbc.co.uk. From me, Peter White, producer Kevin Corr and the team, goodbye.